US President Trump made history a few days ago by stepping across the border from South Korea into North Korea, becoming the first acting US president to do so whilst meeting with Kim Jong-un. The reason why this was such a big deal is because, of course, the history between the United States and North Korea have been anything but friendly, and in fact have been downright hostile for most of history. And with all this news going around lately, I wanted to find out, well, why is this the case? Why have the United States and North Korea got such a bad history, and where did it all go wrong? To answer this question, let's go back to 1910, which is the Year in which the Korean Empire, or what had been the Korean Empire, was officially annexed by the Japanese and started a period of Japanese rule in Korea. Now, in 1905 already, Japan had announced that Korea was its protectorate, and the peninsula went from ruling itself to being ruled over from Japan instead. Now, the Japanese had very many imperial ambitions, which they started to play out in the 1930s. And this, of course, eventually bled into the larger Second World War in the Pacific. In 1941, nationalist Koreans who wanted to fight against the Japanese formed the Korean Liberation Army, which fought in China against the Japanese fighting there. Of course, there were also very many Koreans who were fighting for the Japanese who were enlisted and were often used as guards for the various camps that the Japanese installed as they weren't entirely trusted. But of course, by 1945, the tide of the war had turned very much against the Japanese. The Americans had successfully island hopped until the home islands were in sight. The Soviets were also poised on their borders to the east with the Japanese in China and in Korea. And of course, in August, the first atom bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Now, the day after the first atom bomb had been dropped, the Soviets declared war and pressed over the border. But would they allow the Koreans to choose their own destiny when they were finally free from the Japanese imperial yoke? No. On the 15th of August, the Japanese officially surrendered. But Soviet troops continued to stream south until they reached Pyongyang on the 24th of August. In Pyongyang, they found people's committees, socialist groups that were pro-Soviet, and so the Soviets promoted them and built a government up using these groups. Now, the Americans were worried that if they did nothing, that the Soviets would spread out and take the entire Korean peninsula for themselves, adding another puppet to their already expanding group of puppet states in Eastern Europe. The Americans proposed that they split the Korean Peninsula into two spheres of influence along the 38th parallel, which split the country almost in two while the North would have a higher population, the Americans would still gain control of the very important city of Seoul. Now in the North, the capital city would obviously become Pyongyang, which is also an important city, but Seoul was really what the Americans were after. Now, the North would become a communist country that was led that way by Kim Il-sung, who had fought against the Japanese in China and had been trained by the Soviets and was friendly towards the Soviets. Whilst in the South, the system would remain a capitalist system, very anti-communist guy called Seung Man Lee took over and started purging anyone he suspected of being a communist, leading to the deaths of tens of thousands of people. And actually, come to think of it, this flag design for showing capitalism really wasn't a good idea because if we just change the background colour, then we have the flag of communist Vietnam. Seriously, guys? No one, no one picked up on this? Really? You know what it is, right? I work really... While all this was going on, from 1945 to 1949, in neighbouring China, there was a civil war between the communists and the nationalists. And in 1949, Mao Zedong and the communists were victorious. And so attention was called from the communists in the region back to Korea, as a new communist superpower, the Chinese, were now also operating in the area. Joseph Stalin saw that while the Americans hadn't intervened in China and let the communists win, that the likelihood was that if they invaded South Korea, as had been his goal, then the Americans would simply sit back and do nothing, just as they had done in China. So in 1950, North Korean troops crossed over the border and invaded the South. The Americans responded and sent troops in with the UN, and this is, of course, how the Korean War started. And the Korean War is really a large 
part of the problem with North Korea is that this is really where it all kicked off. The Korean War lasted for three years and it was the North's attempt to conquer the rest of the Korean Peninsula but it's basically the only reason that they were not able to do this was because of the American intervention. Another big factor in the enmity between the two was the prolonged and extremely heavy bombing of North Korea which led to the deaths of up to a million civilians which is far more than Japan sustained during the Second World War or that the German cities sustained during the Second World War which were around in the uh, hundreds of thousands. I think the German casualties were up to 400,000 and the Japanese might have gone up to 700,000. But this was on an unprecedented scale and is very much remembered in North Korea today. Of course, when the Allies were on the brink of victory, the Chinese got involved and then the war turned and it turned into a stalemate basically along the old borderline. And in 1953, they signed the ceasefire together. Although importantly, there was never a peace accord. So technically, they are still at war with one another. And really, this is what we kind of see in the Korean Peninsula with very high tensions in a demilitarized zone along the borderline in the middle with various skirmishes taking place and missiles being fired and planes shot down and ships being shot down, etc. And this is in large part why the Korean Peninsula remains divided between the two to this day. Now as well, many of these incidents involve the United States who have a strong military presence in the region. For example, in 1968, we have the incident with the USS Pueblo, which was a US spy ship that was sent to off the coast of North Korea, which was intercepted by submarines and by fighter pilots of the North Korean Air Navy and Air Force, and who were then captured and interned in prisoner of war camps until they were released. We also have, in 1976, a border incident where US troops in the demilitarized zone were chopping down trees and they were then set upon by a gang of North Korean soldiers armed with axes and two of them were beaten to death. In 1994, the relationship with North Korea took a turn that would become a very significant turn and certainly is how I, growing up, saw North Korea and the threat from North Korea. And this is, of course, the nuclear program that the North Koreans created. They started to test nuclear weapons and to threaten various countries around them, the Japanese, of course, the South Koreans, and the United States themselves with nuclear attacks from these missiles that they'd created. And this is indeed why Trump was in uh, North Korea recently. And a lot of efforts since the mid-1990s have been to try to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula especially on the end of the North Koreans, whose nuclear capacity we really don't know because obviously the system in North Korea is very closed so it's very hard to get the kind of information. For a long time, people in the West had no idea how seriously we should actually take the threats coming out of North Korea, whether they could actually build a working missile or not. Many people fear that just as in the Korean War, the actions in Korea could lead to a further global conflict because of course, South Korea is supported by the United States, whereas North Korea is is often supported by the Chinese, who remain really one of their only allies in the world, but it's China, so that's quite a scary thing for a lot of people to anticipate, as it's two of the world's superpowers on two opposing sides in a very volatile situation. In 2009, two American journalists were snatched from the border region and detained in Korea until the former president Bill Clinton flew into Pyongyang and secured their release. In 2010, there was more drama as the North Koreans shot down and sank a South Korean ship, the Cheonan. And in 2011, there was a great shift in North Korea as North Korea's leader Kim Jong-il died and was replaced by his younger son Kim Jong-un rather than his elder son as one might expect, King Jong-nam, who really went on a different path and was recently assassinated in Kuala Lumpur airport in Malaysia by North Korean agents using, I think it was a nerve agent to assassinate him there, which was quite big news a few years ago. And so that's why it was big news when Donald Trump stepped over the border, when President Trump stepped into North Korea, because that hasn't happened before. We haven't had an active US president in the Korean Peninsula going over the, um, the DMZ out of South Korea and into North Korea and shaking hands with a North Korean president there. And hopefully this indicates that relations will continue to improve in the future as Kim Jong-un did start with a bang, so to speak. 
he tested several new missiles and made several threats uh, to the South and to the Americans and vice versa with President Trump threatening the North Koreans and insulting Kim Jong-un and a lot of political play going on but hopefully this is some tangible evidence that things are going to settle down in the Korean Peninsula um, and I guess we will see how the relationship goes in the future. Alright everyone, thank you very much for watching. I hope this has been interesting. I just thought with all this stuff about Korea in the news, it might be good to actually get some backstory. I'm going to try and cover a bit more sort of, not really current affairs, that, um, but more sort of the history behind current affairs because I think that's quite an interesting thing to look at because such a big deal was made when, you know, the President of the United States stepped over the border into another country and you think, well, why is that? And essentially the history is all there that's why it's such a big deal because of the enmity between these two states that really could have sparked into a global conflict and many people are still worried that it might spark a global conflict honestly i don't know enough about the uh, modern political situation to know if this was a good move on president trump's part or not but i hope that it is a move towards further peace and stability in the region all right virtue signaling done i have been hilbert and this has been the history